The following podcast is part of the Gunna Geek Network. The opinions expressed may not represent other podcasts or affiliates of Gunna Geek. Check out more podcasts at GunnaGeek.com. And now get ready because geekness starts in three, two, one. Do, 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 do. Are you are you whistling DuckTales? Are you whistling the moon theme? Yeah, I absolutely was whistling the moon theme. At least I whistle well enough to where you could tell what I was whistling. Good enough. At least you whistled good enough. That's how it's pronounced. Oh, I pronounced well wrong, didn't I? Yeah. But I have come to expect nothing more from you. Than wrong. Nothing more than wrong. So there's that. I am sick as f- Yeah, dude. Way. Me too. Really? This, d- yeah, this sweater sucks balls. This sweater sucks the testicles. You're it's- still sick. Yes. No, I got re-sick. I, got re- I was sick last week. Yeah, you got re-sick last week. You should be yeah. good by now. Dude, colds last forever. Your cold lasts forever. Cold, colds last forever. Your cold is- lasts forever. It does. Did I get you, did I get you sick over the the podcast you got me sick it was either because we were talking on skype you got me sick or because of the sex that we had oh we did we did have the sex yeah so yeah listen to me i just took five milligrams of lor- loratadine and 120 milligrams of pseudoephedrine sulfate good for you am i going to fall asleep during this recording no one of those is an upper and the other is a downer So, it's like I just had a Red Bull vodka? That's exactly right. So, I have some Mountain Dew in my fridge. Are you saying that I should go in my kitchen right now and get a Mountain Dew and vodka and make it? I would. Okay. You want to keep the drug cocktail going. It feed They feed off each other. Yeah. How do you have any energy for this recording? I still can't breathe out of my nose. I, I don't know. I fake it till I make it. My head felt like a balloon today, but it was the Heisenberg blimp. Did you notice I called it the Heisenberg blimp? Yeah, I did. And not the Hindenburg? We need to cook. So, this is episode 57 of Unqualified Gamers. I am Cody. I am John. Yeah. Yeah. And we are both sick. Yeah. No, we're doing this for you, listener. We really Uh are. I'm um, getting over. I'm getting over my illness. Uh, I'm like for the most part, I actually feel all right. I just have that. Like I have a feeling like I. It just feels like I'm going to be congested for the next seven months. I don't know. I, like no matter how good I feel, it feels like I'm never going to be able to breathe out of my nose, maybe ever again. I was outside today and it was fine. And I had I had got a blood draw this morning. I was I was selling plasma. I mean donating blood this morning. That's. That's how that's how the sickness gets in you. That's how the government puts the nanomachines of viruses into your body. Viri. To, to track you. That's how they track you. So they they took blood though. Right, they and then they replace it. It, it happens at the same time. You don't even know what's happening. So what I think may have happened is because I suddenly had one tablespoon less of blood in my system maybe that made me more susceptible to the uh coldness is that a thing that happens nope okay well either way today it came down like a hammer like a guillotine just slicing my head off i I, one minute i was fine and then the next my head felt like it was literally the heisenberg blimp because it was cooking and tonight we cook we need to cook jesse have you noticed that I haven't been funny once this episode? That's what happens when I get sick. I don't, but then you've probably been sick the entire time we've been running this show. Yep. So that said, uh, irregardless of the fact that we are that we are both sick, we are here for you, uh, listener, and and uh, we are unqualified to talk about video games. We do like them. We we play a lot of them. Uh, but we are by no means professionals in any in any way. I mean, John has a job, I guess. I have a job, but that 
That's different. Yes, that certainly doesn't mean we're professional. Though. It's accurate. So there's that. Normally we talk about our weekends and then um, talk about video games and then talk about like what you, the listener, have been playing because we're all about the social medias and all that stuff. But I, I – Propose we change things up a bit this week. Is that okay with you, John? Jonathan? John? I I wasn't ready for this. I didn't get the show notes, so um, I'm unprepared. So, do you know why you didn't get the show notes? Am I being replaced? You're being replaced. I'm I'm cool with this because I can't breathe out of my nose. Right. So I I wasn't. Go- I mean, I didn't want to have to tell you this way, but you are actually being replaced by Mark Wahlberg. You know, I'm actually okay with that. Yeah. I like Mark Wahlberg. You know, um, so I literally don't know who that is. Like, I know the name. I know that Mark Wahlberg is a celebrity. But, like, I, I just pulled a Hollywood name out of my ass. Like, if you asked me to point out uh, either Mark, Mark Wahlberg or Paul Rudd in a police lineup, I would have no idea who they are. Not even I, remotely. I guess that's fair. I'm not kidding. Like, I'm so bad with Hollywood celebrity names. It's atrocious. I have no idea who Mark Wahlberg is. I don't know who Paul Rudd is. Uh, and that's my story, and I'm sticking to it. But you're still being replaced by him. That sounds like a good weekend. I thought so. No, so I, so here's the deal. So you are very – are we talking about Mario 3D World this episode? I would like to. Okay, so um, John has been just really eagerly anticipating talking about Mario 3D World and Nintendo and having a, a nice um, spirited discussion about Nintendo, which is great. And I want to do that to start off with because we recently – I know you heard this at the start of the episode uh, that we are part of the Gunna Geek Network, but that is a new thing for us or a newer thing. So I anticipate that we have some new listeners, new audience, and um, – I my story from this weekend regards professional wrestling, and the last thing I want to do is expose any of our new listeners to twenty mm, ish minutes of me talking about a wrestling event and professional wrestling before we even talk about video games. So while that would, if that was just, if this was just our standard typical episode, I may expose you to that. But this time, I think we should just get right to the games, and then I can give my crazy story about my weekend which involved the WWE Royal Rumble 2014. I think it's a fun story, but I just I just say we get to the actual video games first. No, that's fine. Let's just change everything about the show. Let's just not ask my opinion about what I want at all. I wasn't going to. So, But first, we'll talk about what the listeners have been playing this weekend, um, just to, to kind of warm up, because I feel like just diving into a serious discussion about Nintendo is a little much. Would you agree? I guess. That's good, because I was going to read what our listeners have been playing this weekend, no matter what your answer to that question was. So by answering in the affirmative, you've at least kind of, like, made me seem like less of an a**, which, of course, I negated by telling you that, but here we are. Not to mention, it's, you're you're pretty much an a**, so. So there's that. So Jamie just got a three-month PlayStation Plus card, so probably some Bioshock Infinite, also, more Final Fantasy Tactics. Approve. We both approve of that. Highly. Um, Miles also is playing Bioshock Infinite and some Batman Arkham Origins on New Game Plus. I think that uh, Bioshock Infinite was the free game on PS Plus. So, is Are you serious? Yeah, isn't that cool? I was, PS- was going to ask because Jasmine is the next person in, in Jasmine. He said, aw, Bioshock Infinite with, with an anime happy face. So Yeah, PS Plus is really cool. So that that's the free game on PS Plus this month. So you mean they're not giving garbage games like Crackdown? <laughs> and the original Gears of War? <laughs> which it just came out that Microsoft bought that IP today. Gears of War? Yeah. That's you right. know, like, like the 35-year-old IP? 30 it's it's like 10 years old it's still it's 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 old do you have something against gears of war i love gears of war i just i would i would prefer they channel their energy into some newer stuff i guess that story was told like way told like over told so clearly you've never played a halo game I haven't actually played a Halo game. Yeah, well, you want a story that's been told and overtold, there you go. Check out that series. Um, Josh has uh, said he was going to probably play some Just Cause 2, Planet Side 2, and a heavily modded Skyrim. That all sounds kind of fun. I don't know Just Cause or Planet Side. 
Do you? Yeah, I know what they are. Uh, Planet Side is a massively multiplayer, persistent first-person shooter. So it's like, I, I want to say it's on different servers. Every server is like a copy of this world. And then there's various battles raging over the like the whole world and you can jump in and I I think you can be like an infantry unit but you can also get into vehicles and stuff too. Um I know that about that game. So just cause just cause two is an open world game with some ridiculous crazy ass physics. Like it's got this this hook ability that like you like you you can like use a parachute to go crazy high into the air and then you can hook onto stuff and then move around the environment by hooking onto stuff and flying away with the parachute. Um, and like, that's the whole thing is, is moving like moving around the environment is the thing of that game. And then you can also hook two things together, like two driving trucks that you hook together and then they like fly off the road. Can I just commend you for being able, like I actually want to congratulate you. I'm legitimately impressed with your ability to, make up video games on the spot and just invent insane systems that don't actually exist anywhere for no reason. I am a creative person. Yeah, so, I mean, none of what you just said sounds real. Yeah, I think that's fair. It probably wasn't. Okay, just want to make sure we're on the same page. Uh, Justin is playing Gunman Clive. I haven't heard of that. What is that? I don't know, I don't know what that is. All right, and Pokemans X. Up to, I, don't know what, I don't know what that is. Yeah, I do. Up to 642 out of 718 Pokemon. How? How did you do that? Well, that's got to be across multiple games, obviously. Uh, so be- here's my question. I know you can... So uh, Diamond and Pearl came before Black and White, correct? Uh, God made Diamond and Pearl on the fourth day. Yeah. And I think he made... Or she made uh, black and white on the fifth day. So, okay. yes. So, my understanding is Diamond and Pearl are the earliest generation that is compatible with X and Y. Diamond and Pearl, I believe, were Game Boy Advance? Question mark? Or DS? It, so- it sounds to me like at this point you know way more about Pokemon than I do. Okay. Well, I know fourth generation you can trade with fifth generation. I don't know how, but I know you can. And when then, have we ever cared if what we were saying was in fact correct? No, I know, but I'm trying to at least maintain some, like, facade of... of Unqualifiedness? Of qualifiedness, a little bit. Um, but, and I know then you can trade fifth with sixth generation, which is current generation. Uh, my understanding is that the first three generations are, like, their own thing, and you can trade up to three, and then, like, three and four don't, they don't cross-pollinate. So, apparently... It's not, the, not the right word. Well, it is now. Apparently, red and blue and yellow that I have, my Pokemons on those are worthless, essentially. Effectively, they're dead. They're effectively dead. They're fossils. They're black and white. They're forgotten to the world. So I don't I don't know how you get some of those early ones. I don't know how all of that works. Um, so, but kudos, if you got 642, I don't know how you did that, but well done. It's a lot of catching. Have you been on uh, Wonder Trade or the global trading system lately? I have not tried to Wonder Trade ever. Have you global trading systemed? I don't even know what that is. So global trading system, you can deposit a Pokemon and then say, I will allow this Pokemon to go away and be traded for this Pokemon. So for example, whenever I have an extra Pokemon, I deposit that Pokemon and then say that I will accept a level 1 through 10 Eevee. You can specify the gender if you want and you can specify the level. I always give it the lowest level possible because I want a beginner Eevee. I want like 10 of them so that I can evolve them into all of Eevee's different forms and then raise them because I love Eevee. It's my favorite Pokemon. So I do this all the time. But it's funny because you can browse what other people are looking for. And you'll see, like, just the most uh, mundane Pokemon, like even level 1 Eevees and 80% of the Pokemon that people want are Yelvinus and Xerneas, the legendary Pokemon from X and Y. Okay. So it's just like, 
oh, what can I trade in my Butterfree for? <laughs> and they'll, or what, how can I get a Butterfree? And it's like, oh, I'll trade in my Butterfree for a, I don't know, the legendary unique Pokemon you can only get one way. I just think it's kind of funny. It's people being dicks. So apparently no one else thinks it's funny. So you're welcome for that. No, they they all laughed. Our canned laughter went off. Thank you. Uh, man, I'm not going to go back and edit in canned laughter. That's way too much effort. Way too much effort. Vintage Gamer Jarly finished his second playthrough of Final Fantasy XIII, playing through Final Fantasy XIII 2, and been playing the hell out of Final Fantasy XIII 3, the Lightning Returns demo. I believe I played through the original game twice. I played through Final Fantasy XIII twice as well. I played through... We both did. We both played through... I played through Final Fantasy XIII on Xbox 360, and then a few months later I got a PS3 for my birthday, and I got it on PS3 and played through it on PS3. Yeah, and I did the exact same thing, actually. Wait, really? Yeah. So, yeah. Um, Only I did the opposite, so I got... I went from, like, uh, the game perfectly perfectly working to the game being choppy as hell because Wait, the you, Xbox 360 version was really choppy. Why did you go that way? Because I didn't know that there was a performance difference. Are you are you kidding me? Yeah, I, I didn't do a lot of research on the different versions of the game. Why did you even get rid of your PS3 version? I didn't. Why did you get the Xbox 360 version? I probably got it as a gift or something, or I borrowed it from somebody. Why would you open it if you had already played through it on a different console with better specs? I don't know. I am furious at this revelation. That is one of the dumbest things. This is That's like almost as bad as you playing seven hours of Final Fantasy VII and forgetting to save. I feel like I own multiple... Co- I think I own Dark Souls on both consoles. I, I, I... Oh my god. I... Why is this angering me so like I don't know how to process this information. I actually own a couple games on both consoles, I think. I would need to go look. We well, got I mean you got trophies and then you've got uh you know your gamer score. So you have to I mean you got to do both of those. Is it sad that I actually find that a legitimate reason? <laughs> like when you started saying that, I was thinking in my head, yeah, okay, that makes sense. <laughs> how depressing is that? That's pretty depressing. I can't tell if you were kidding or not. I think you were. And yet, and yet, I found that to be an acceptable reason to own the same game on multiple consoles. Sure. Awesome. Uh, Vintage Gamer Charlie, I'm not done posting our old episodes online yet, but I will tell you, Final Fantasy XIII 2, John and I talked about for like seven episodes straight. The kind of running joke the first few months we were doing this podcast was that I was constantly just talking about Final Fantasy XIII 2, which is kind of true. So I'm looking forward to getting those episodes online. (laughs) If you want to hear what we thought of that game, there is plenty of material to hear about that game. I'm kind of excited for XIII 3 to come out. I am as well, and I now of course I played the demo at E3, uh, so there's my humble brag of the episode. There you go, drink, listener. If you're playing the unqualified drinking game, now you can drink. Uh, so I have no desire to play the demo, and John, I know you're not into demos because you're just not. So you're not gonna. Yeah, but you know what I found out? We were, we talked like a couple of weeks ago about the um, uh, bravely default flying fairy demo, and I found out that the demo is completely separate from anything that happens in the main game. How cool is that? That is what that is the coolest idea for a demo to me. Wow. Like none of the stuff that happens in the demo happens anywhere in the regular game. They made a demo specifically as a demo. And that that is part of the reason why I don't like demos is because I don't want to play a bunch of something and then immediately play through it again. Yeah, that's fair. So this is uh, like I'm very much considering if I ever get some extra time actually playing the Bravely Default demo. And now I'm thinking that as well. Okay. Yep. Uh now Christopher, our robotics friend, uh he wrote a dialogue. He wrote a dialogue in our when we asked what he's playing this weekend. This is all on our Google Plus page by the way. plus.google.com/plusunqualifiedgamers. Thanks Google. Uh so the dialogue is between me, me being Chris, and life. So I'm going to do a dramatic reading of this using two voices. Are you ready for this? Is this like me talking to the state of Minnesota? I, re- I remember that. That went really well. So this is, this is Christopher and life. I don't know what I'm going to play, 
but I will play something this weekend since it's been however long since I've been able to. Don't forget about midterms! <laughs> Li- life sounds a lot like the state of Minnesota. Shut up, life. I just want to have fun. No! <laughs> Fine, but next weekend, I swear, I will play video games all weekend. And scene. That's really good. That It sounds like you've got some formal improv training. I don't know why I... So he didn't actually write that life was laughing. I just added that as a interpretive uh, performance art. Like I said, formal improv training. Yeah. And Scott, he said he played Battlefield 4 and drove a boat around and pretended to be a pirate sinking other ships. He wrote played in, in quotation marks, in air quotes. I played Battlefield 4 and pretended to be a pirate. That sounds fun. I'm not even pretend like I know anything about the way Battlefield 4, the robustness of playing that game. Robustosity. Right. I, I'm not even going to pretend like I know the robustosity of playing that game. Uh, neither am I. Neither am I. We're both so unqualified, we're not even going to pretend to be a little qualified. Exactly. But it sounds like fun. Yeah. I mean... I. Being a pirate's fun. Yeah. So now that we've spent 20 minutes talking about how sick we are not being funny and explaining what our listeners played and riffing on that, I like riffing, don't you? Yeah, it's really good. It's a good word. All right. Now I want you to just sink as deep as you can into the world of Nintendo while I drink water and try not to sniffle. Okay. So, listener, uh, you may not remember, but I received a... Wii U for Christmas. Um, and it was the Mario bundle. And then I also got Mario 3D World at Christmas as well. So I basically started off my Wii U collection with, what is it, New Super Mario Brothers Wii? What I can't even keep track of the names of the of the 2D ones anymore. The names are getting a little ridiculous. Uh, yes, it's New Super Mario Brothers Wii U... Not to be confused with New Super Mario Brothers Wii. Man. Okay. So I got New Super Mario Brothers Wii U and New Super Luigi Brothers Mario Brothers Wii U. It's New Super Luigi Wii U, I think. I don't really know. And then you also got Super Mario Th- World 3D World. I got New Super Mario 3D World Luigi University uh, Power Champion. Rangers U. Champion Edition. Right. Turbo. Okay. No, I got so I got new I got uh, New Super Mario Brothers 3D World U, the 3D World one, the newest one. I got that one too. Um, and when I first got them, I was like, all right, I got all these games now. Um, I was getting a little sick of the 2D platformers, but I you know I got two games worth of them, and I was like, I, you know, if I start playing, I because I had heard so many great things about New Super Mario 3D World. That I was like, if I start playing that first, I'm not going to have any desire ever to go back and play New Super Mario 3D Brothers Wii U. Championship Edition. So, the first thing that I did was start playing that game. Um, And that was like, that to me was your standard Super Mario Brothers, New Super Mario Brothers experience. Like, it was everything, it just felt everything normal. Uh, it was a, like a solid 2D platformer. A lot of the levels were pretty inventive, but for the most part, it was just a 2D platformer. Um, you know, you collect three coins per level if you want to, and that's where like the real challenge of the level comes through. Otherwise, the game's not challenging at all. Um, and I don't know. It was okay. Did you ever play it? Um, yes, briefly. It's not much different than New Super Mario Brothers Wii. Right, and like that's the thing is it's. It's this new game, but it's not any different than what we had already played, kind of at all. Well, well, unless you're playing with the gamepad. Well, you you play with the gamepad, right? I did, except that when you play with the gamepad, you don't get to affect the in-game environments unless you're playing with another person and you're playing with the gamepad. Right. So I thought that was kind of dumb. Um I would have liked to have had the gamepad and like, because the the second player, if you're playing with other with another person, the other person can do like, 
I don't even know if they call the mode. They, it's a separate mode where they have the gamepad and they're not actually playing the game per se. They're not. They don't. They're not represented by a character in the game. They just have the gamepad and they're seeing whatever it is that you are doing when you're playing the game. Except they can touch various parts on the gamepad to create uh, ledges, like create platforms for you to jump on. And freeze enemies and attack enemies. And freeze and attack enemies, right. So um, the it is kind of sad, though, that I can't just do that myself. Like That seems like something I should just be able to do by myself on the gamepad. But whatever. It's not important. That was a decision they made. I'm sure they wanted to... Because it would be super easy, I guess, to get all the coins if you did it that way. So, I guess that's why they did that. Whatever. Anyway, I wasn't, I wasn't like, terribly impressed. I got through, like, the first three or four worlds. I certainly didn't get all the coins in all the levels. Um, and I was like, okay. Like, that was pretty fun. But, like, I, I'm not terribly impressed by this. Um, so, then I moved on. And I was like, all right. Well, I love my my Wii U. Took a brief 25-hour period to play through Earthbound, which I... A brief 25-hour period. Good. Yeah, so I downloaded Earthbound off the off the Wii U shop, and man, that game is good. It's really good. <laughs> uh, it's it's really it's it stays pretty funny. Um, it's a it's a role playing game that came out for the Super Nintendo. It was very rare. It was a very rare game. Um, there aren't a ton of copies out there, but it's got this huge cult following to it. Uh, and it, I played through the whole game again. Which really surprised me. Um, that you stuck to it? Yeah. And the, I think the main reason why it was easy for me to do it was I love, and I knew I was going to love this, but I love the gamepad being portable. Yeah. Like, like being able to start play, like be downstairs in my basement on my 55 inch TV, playing Earthbound on my 55 inch TV, and then at about. 8.30 when my wife goes to bed and like I need to start heading to bed. Uh, I go upstairs and my gamepad reaches all the way up there, upstairs, and I'm able to just play in bed on the gamepad. That is really slick. Yeah. Um, so I really like that. Uh, so yeah, I took like a brief 25-hour period, did that. And then I was like, all right, now it is time. It is time to start New Super Mario 3D World. I was like saving it like you would, you know, the dessert of a fine dinner because I just knew it was going to be something that I was going to want to play a lot of. Yeah, that's what I'm doing with Wonderful 101 right now. I wanted to finish uh, Metal Gear Rising first. So it's sitting there, and it's about ready for me to sink my teeth into. Sure. So I started playing it, and uh, the like from the get-go of this game, it is just fu- it's fun, right? I mean, that's... It, okay, so... <laughs> Well, this well is said. this is this is where you start. This is where you kind of start to get into the the philosophy of Nintendo, um, and why like Nintendo is important, because this game, this game is the same story you've always seen in every Mario game ever. And y- I realize now more than ever that like Ma- Mario games and Nintendo games in general, some of them have like a light story, but it's not, and it's oftentimes well told. But there's nothing usually of, of, like, a lot of significance in the stories that are told. And especially with something like Mario, where every game starts off with either the princess being kidnapped or somebody else being in, like, danger. And it's gotten to the point now where they don't even use words when they tell their stories, which is fine. You know, that's like that's kind of like a Disney-Pixar principle, where you want to make things relatable to all people. So you can, like, you can literally, like, tell the story without words, and that's what they do. You know, so there's just like this race of fairy people that gets abducted by Bowser because that's what he does. And it is your job to go save them. And it doesn't take place in the Mushroom Kingdom. It takes place somewhere else. Yeah. But, but the game doesn't need a complicated, incredible deep story because the, the, the Nintendo philosophy is we are going to hone and focus on the mechanics of our games so much and we're going to nail that aspect of our game so well that it's just going to be fun to play the game and you you don't necessarily care where the setting of this is like this this game didn't need to be a mario game it's a mario game because it's of such high quality and that they they put their you know they put their 
intellectual properties on these games so they can sell more. All that makes sense. But this didn't need to be a Mario game. There's no like complicated story here that you know makes it a Mario game or anything. It could have been any other platformer, but it's since it's a Nintendo game and they're sitting in the Mario universe, it's it's a Mario game. But I say all that and I preface the whole the whole conversation we're going to have by that because the game is one of the most fun games to play that I can remember playing in a really long time. Like really? there are there are no there are there were very 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 few maybe two times um I I didn't keep track where like I was playing the game and wasn't having fun. So there were parts where I would I would die like 20 times specifically towards the later levels. Um but I was still having fun because I felt like I was like learning what I was doing. Like I was getting a little better at a, l- a little closer at collecting everything in the level that I was trying to get to. Um but I was always having fun with the game. And there are plenty of other games where I I play them and there are much longer periods of time where I'm just like, man, I wish they could just like speed this up so I could get to this other part that I was having a lot of fun with. So it's just it's a testament to Nintendo's game design that I just found the game kind of always fun. It was always fun to play. And you um, have beaten the game, correct? So I have com- I have completed the game. Um, I b- like most I think modern Mario games now. Um, you complete the game and then it usually unlocks some other like crazy hard world. Um, if listener, if you, if you don't know anything about this game, it's set up like, like super Mario world was for the super Nintendo. Um, kind of also set up like the, it's like a cross between super Mario galaxy and the new super Mario brothers games. Because the worlds that you go to are 3D environments, unlike those new Super Mario Brothers games. Um, but they also have a time limit constraint, and they have a single world, unlike Galaxy. Whereas, like Galaxy, you would pick a star, and then the world would kind of change and conform to that star's whatever they had programmed f- to get that star. You know what I mean? It was, it was the, uh, the infrastructure of the worlds was more like Mario 64. Right. Where you're like in a castle or you're in an environment and you jump into a painting or shoot off into another world. Like, so there was like a 3d kind of nonlinear organic kind of central hub in Mario 64. That's how Mario galaxy operates. But Mario 3d world is more like the way Mario world operates. Yeah, I mean, there's an overworld map, and you go into the worlds. And what's weird is the 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 levels that are in each world. Like, they still have you know your standard desert world and ice world and stuff. But as far as I can tell, the levels in each of those worlds have absolutely nothing to do with the with the other environment, like the outside environment of the world. It's just like a way that they have their settings to make it visually interesting and diverse. Yeah, for uh, the most part. Yeah. Regardless, though. Um, but every world is like super different. Um, and then in each world, it is your goal to get to the end of the world. And then just like the new super Mario brothers games, there are three green stars that you can collect in each world that oftentimes require maybe some difficult platforming, or they require you to do a little bit of searching and like find kind of like a secret area or something to get the three green stars. And then there's also a stamp um, that you can get that you can then use in your Miiverse posts to create pictures. So they've got like a perfect stamp of a drawing that they have done. And you use that stamp to make pictures, which by the way is really freaking cool. Yeah. Uh, You can make some really funny pictures with those stamps. Um, So it gives you kind of like a, you know, some of the levels are not challenging kind of at all to get to the end of the level. But getting the three green stars is really where the challenge of the game comes. Um, And that's kind of the structure of the game. So, you know, you play through a world and then you get to the end and there's a boss something. There's like a boss castle. Occasionally you'll fight Bowser, but for the most part, it's something else. And then you will move on to the next world and it's kind of all the same thing. Um, And then once you get to the very, very end of the game and and you finally vanquish Bowser, 
Spoiler alert. You beat Bowser at the end of a Mario game. What? So the, it unlocks it unlocks another another world, <clears throat> another two worlds really. Um and the the levels I have not actually the very very last world has a bunch of worlds in it just like all the all of the other worlds. It's got a bunch of levels in it. I cannot even complete the first level of the last world. <laughs> now Now to be fair, I played this game like straight getting all of the green stars in every level for like three days. So it was all I did for three days. So by the time I got to that very end, I was a little burned out. I just haven't gone back to it. I do have every intention to go back to it. But that last world is crazy hard. Um, so that's kind of fun because that's going to give me something that I can continue to have fun with with that game for a, a long time still. At least until I can kind of master those last few worlds. Yeah, and that difficulty uh, mirrors the difficulty in the original Super Mario World because the special world levels in Mario World were quite challenging as well. They were. Yeah, they definitely were. The ones in the Star Road, you mean? The Star Road, yes. The Star Road, yeah. The Star Road in, in Mario World was not a walk in the park. For the most part. Right. So, anyway, that's that's kind of the structure of the game. The the thing for me is that the the game is really good. Really, really good. Getting the green stars is really fun. Some of them are really cleverly hidden. Other others of them aren't. Um but I really enjoyed going through each of the levels and, and trying to find the the three green stars. There was only one star that I had to look up how to get and when I looked it up I was pissed because it was something that I was never going to be able to I would have never found it. Oh really? I don't think, yeah. And I, it was probably just a, like a mental block for me in, in terms of getting the star, but I was just never going to find it. I never would have like connected the dots as to what I needed to do to get to it. Um, so, but regardless, beat the game, all was great. Um, and then I, I sat back and reflected on it a little bit, and I was like, you know, the game went by real, like really fast. Like it felt like it went, and maybe it was just because, you know, I played it for three days straight, but part of the thing that made me a little sad about the game was if you if you go into a level and you get all three green stars and the stamp out of the level the very first time you play it you don't have any reason to go back into that level so there are probably some things that like i'm just some some cute little design things that they may have done that i'm going to miss because i just don't have an incentive to go back to those levels again Unless I go back and want to play through the whole game again at some point, right? So, what it really did, and remember, I had a ton of fun with this game. I loved this game. But what this game really did for me was it made me want another Super Mario Galaxy game. It made me want an, another 3D Mario game. Which is with, really, with really that same, that same structure. I want a game where you have like you have to you have an excuse to go into the same level like six times and it's like a different part of the level every time but there are just different clever things hidden around every corner in each of those levels like super mario galaxy was transcendent in terms of video games for me it was that game was incredible that game raised the bar yeah it it was that game was it it was something un, it was unbelievable that yeah. game was unbelievable at the time um and and while this game is really good, it is not that. Okay? Like if you are expecting a game that is going to that is going to change the way that you look at platforming games, this is not the game. Um it is just a solid 3D platformer. They have some really challenging fun stuff, but it is not it is not it does not raise the bar as you said. Um well, for single player, but how about the multiplayer? I never actually played any multiplayer. So you haven't played any? I haven't played any multiplayer. Okay. I've heard it's pretty chaotic in the game. Um, and that could be good or it could be bad. I don't know. Sh- sure. But just like most Mario games, they have, they've added a bunch of stuff that, like a bunch of power-ups that are really fun and change, change the way you play the game. Specifically, the cat suit, which they had advertised forever. It, you know, it allows you to climb anything. Which I love is that cat suit. Super satisfying. Oh god, yeah. To just be able to to just be able to climb kind of whatever you want. And they've done some fun stuff where there's like always 
and even in levels where you don't get the cat suit, they've put some stuff on like the top of platforms that there's no way you could get to them without being able to climb. So if you move from one level to the next, and you still have the cat suit, for instance, you can climb to the top of these areas and you can find like extra lives. You can find coins. Um, they'll they'll put some things up there to kind of uh, reward you for exploring the levels. But the cat suit lets you climb anything. It lets you climb up the flagpole at the end of the level um, to reach to hit the top of the flagpole. Um, and it basically allows you to kind of melee brawl a little bit because you can claw. Um, so that and, th- and they do they do the smartest thing ever, and that is literally the first thing you get in terms of power ups when you start the game. So you don't have to wait a single minute to check out like this great new thing that they've done, right? Yeah, I noticed that as well. Um, and then they've also they also advertised clear pipes, which when I heard about that, I was like, all, all right. Like, I guess that's a thing that could be cool, I guess. I didn't think anything of it. But the way they've implemented it in the game, it's really cool. Like, you can see everything that's going on through the pipes. Enemies can move through the pipes. And you can, like, you can throw other things through the pipes. So you could you could uh, stomp on a Koopa Troopa, for instance, and then you could throw the shell through the pipe and kill something on, like, the other side. Yeah. Or you can shoot fireballs through the pipes. And wa- you get to watch the fireball travel through the pipe, come out the end. And it's just really cool. It's fun. Um, and it's something you haven't seen before. And it also allows them later in the game, and they do it a little bit early in the game, but later in the game you get a couple levels that are centered around the mechanic of these clear pipes where you can see... You have to like alter your course in the pipe as you're going to avoid enemies that you can see um, and then move from pipe to pipe that way. So there's some cool stuff they've done with that. Um, and then there's another there's another power-up, which is probably my favorite power-up in the whole game, which are the cherries. And there are levels that use these cherries, and when you when you collect a cherry, it spawns a duplicate of whatever character you're playing. So if I'm playing Mario, I get a cherry, and another Mario appears right next to me. The inputs for that Mario are the ex- like he moves the exact same as your main Mario moves, and interacts with every piece in the world as if you. Were it's hard to explain. Basically, he he does whatever it is the other Mario is doing. Like you you control all of them at once. Yeah, you're controlling two or more Marios at the same time. Right, with with one input. So up is going to move both of them up. However, one may be stuck against a wall and cannot move up, but the other one can continue to move forward. So like you can separate them and move them around depending on the geometry of the level, which which makes for some really like mind bending puzzle stuff later. Um, when they use more advanced like pieces of this mechanic, um, but you'll get like one cherry and you'll spawn you know, you know you'll spawn another another Mario and then you'll get a third cherry and a fourth cherry and you may have up to like five Marios moving on a single input on just you like moving around, which is crazy, really fun, um, and they do some really great things where like you don't like need to get these cherries right. Like there's there you may need to do do it once you may need to get like one cherry to progress to the end of the level, but for the most part you don't actually need to get them they're just like power ups scattered throughout the level, but they'll do things like in order to get the final green star you have to make it to the end of the level with four Mario's because there'll be a little a little square a square on the ground that says just the number four on it and that lets you know that's how many of your character you need to get onto this platform to like reveal the star so you'll have to go through the entire level without losing any of these other cherry marios that you've got so it just adds like a completely different way to play that particular level super fun um i don't know if you've if you've seen the level yet where you have all those cherries and you have to go down this giant slide no i've not gotten there yet okay it's great you'll you'll get there uh you have to get to the bottom of this slide with with four marios to get the final green star. Oh, and the God. Marios like slide at different rates because they get onto the slide at, at different times. And so they all kind of like they start to separate gradually over the course of the slide. It took me a couple it took me to get that final green star it took me probably three, four tries at that that single area of the level. But it was super fun. And like when I got there, I was like, shut up. It was like 
super clever. Like I just knew right away what I had to do. Yeah. And it was a matter of doing it. I loved it. I thought that was great. Super good design. Um, and they just mix stuff up so well. Like you'll have normal 3D platform worlds and then they'll throw in a a level that's a lot like the secret slide level of um, Super Mario 64. Sure. Where you'll, where you'll be on the back of of a, of a big dinosaur looking creature that's on water and you'll you'll be doing basically a slide level and getting stars through that. So um, they just keep things really fresh throughout the whole game, and that is way appreciated because at the very end, you're never sick of any one thing. You know what I mean? And you didn't even mention, you mentioned if you're playing as Mario, you can get up to four Marios. You get the same character selection you did in Mario 2. So you can play as Mario, Luigi, Toad, or Princess, and they all control slightly differently. Yeah, so if you remember in Mario 2, Mario kind of controlled standard, your standard way. Uh, Luigi had like a higher floaty jump. Um, Princess could f- could literally float. Um, and then the Toad could like run fast. And in Mario 2, he could pull stuff up out of the ground fast. Doesn't matter. Um, it sounds cool in theory, except there's really not a lot of reason to change characters because they, they couldn't, they couldn't develop the levels or they could have, but they chose not to develop the levels in such a way where you had to use any specific character. So you never have to use a character to get any goal done. Some of them may make it easier, um, but you can, you can find every green star with any character. And I think that's okay. It is. It's like I said. It's a choice they chose to make. Um, I, just, just as easily, I think they could have gone the other way and said, "All right, we're going to make some stars like you have to change characters and do this other stuff," and that would have been fine too. Yeah, I would have been fine with it. And again, in this game, I think Peach is the best character. Just like in Mario Two. Just like in Mario Two. Yeah. So um, the the thing the thing about this game though is is that they keep. It's the fact that they keep everything so fresh. So th- they will introduce an idea, and you may not see that I- idea again for four whole worlds. You may not see that idea again at all. To give you an example, there's a, there's a level in World 2 called Shadow something, and the, the level deals with shadows. So there's no... There's like a back wall in like this black and white world where it looks like you're, you've got a projector shining forward onto Mario in this 3D world, and you can see his shadow on the back wall, right? And as you're moving through the level, his shadow is moving as well. And they use this shadow to give you indicators of environmental indicators. So you'll be like running to the right, and you'll have, you know, like two black platforms that show up as black on the screen. And then you'll have a star in the middle of them. And you're like, I don't see a star here. So you realize there's a green star that is somewhere on that axis. And they use that shadow to relay that information. And you realize, Oh, I have to run towards the camera because I can run towards the camera yeah. to get this green star. I remember that su- level. Super clever, super cool, really well done. And then as you're moving through the level even further, you go through a door where you you go into the shadow part of the world and you control Shadow Mario. It's really cool. Um, however, you never see that again ever. Really? They just they abandoned the mechanic completely and they just did that for that one time because they thought, hey, this is really cool. And I love that. I love that they're willing to like take that risk and just say, hey, we've got so many ideas that are good that we want you to play with that like we don't need to use this idea over and over and over again, beat you over the head with it and have you get sick of it. Like you'll see it once and you'll say, hey, that's really cool and then you won't see it again and you'll remember it because it's really cool, but it will not overstay its welcome. Yeah, and if you like it enough, that makes that level memorable. I mean, that's that's why in Mario 3... I would use the warp whistle to go to the sky world because those sky levels are so cool and because of the levels with the boot, the big green boot that you get into. Oh, I love that boot. Dude, when I was little, when we were little, I would specifically go to those levels just to get in that freaking boot and run around like and stomp on spinies. I did the exact same thing with the giant world because I thought that that world was awesome. Giant world. I also like giant world. Yeah. 
And no one liked the Ice Worlds because it was hard as hell. Yeah, I think we can all agree on that. Yeah. Um. So, like overall, I just the game is the game is super fun. Doesn't have stuff that ever overstays its welcome. Uh, but it is not the best Mario game I've ever played. Um. So, you know, take that for what it is. It really, it's really a game worth playing. Like it, I think it could. I think it should sell a Wii U. Like if you, if you're wondering. If you want to get a Wii U, but you just like don't feel like you have a game that justifies it, this should be a game that justifies it to me. Like I think this is a system seller. And now this is your first experience with a Wii U game. My first experience with a I mean playing a full game or at least most of it was Wind Waker HD and I got the messages in bottles to kind of showcase that social component where people could draw drawings of Link or write tips or whatever, or take photos in-game. And, of course, this game has that component as well because while you're running around the overworld map of, let's say, like World 2, next to like World 2-3 and World 2-4, there will be a me, uh, like a me, like a person, like an avatar from another console that is standing there and you can read its message that they can make either drawing or using those stamps that you mentioned or a combination of both. So I activated that. Did you have that on and did you see that stuff? I did. I did. And at the end of every single level, you get a uh, montage of drawings that people have made using like the stamps and other things specifically related to that level that kind of go across the screen so you can see some cool pictures that people have made with the stamps as well. Yeah. How would you think of that? How did you like that? It's all right. Um it didn't it didn't necessarily add to it doesn't add at all to the gameplay of the game. It's just kind of a cute little thing that they've thrown on top. Did any of them make you laugh? Yeah. See, and that is awesome. Like you're seeing other user-generated content in a game that is dynamic every time and unexpected every time. And I think that is awesome. Like, if if something, if that feature of the game, it doesn't have to add to the game play per se, but, like, you looked at something because of a feature in that game and you laughed. Like, that's awesome. To me, that is, yeah. like, just an ultimate social media, like, gaming. I mean, that is, to me, that is one of the best ways you can add a social component to anything. Yeah, and it's also really cool that you don't have to commit to, like, playing with this other person. It's just, it's it's an asynchronous thing where they can just leave this thing for you to find. Yeah, you don't have to commit to doing it. You don't have to contribute to it. You don't have to invest in it. You just It's just there for you. Right, exactly. And that I do appreciate. I think that's really neat. Because to me, you know, like, we're in... We're in next gen. Next gen is now, right? You know, I I don't I don't have a PS4. We don't have an Xbox One, so we don't know how that sharing stuff is going, how well it's playing out. But the way Nintendo is integrating just the simplest social sharing functions into the Wii U, I think, just makes you feel so connected to the Nintendo like fan base. You know, at, at least I feel. Like, I consistently feel whenever I turn on a Nintendo game on the Wii U, I consistently feel like I am part of a community every single time. Yeah, I can see that. You know, so, yeah. I don't know if maybe that doesn't, like, uh, wet your gears, oil your gears, grease your gears, grind your gears. I think it's... I think it's just something that I am getting used to. Like, it's something that I'm going to have to continue to get used to and and understand exactly what it is and what it is not. You know what I mean? Kind of. So, um, what did you think? Because you are also playing through this game. Right. Oh, and by the way, the Bowser level, the final Bowser level is, it is phenomenal. Really? It is, it is one of the best Bowser encounters I can remember. Seriously. Yes. It is phenomenal. It's really good. Can't wait. Um, yeah. So, what are you thinking so far? I'm only on World 3. And again, I, I played the demo at E3 with a trade show model. I actually played two different levels with her. Um, so I got to to dabble in the multiplayer. Um, I liked it. I liked the multiplayer. Uh, like you said, nothing nothing mind-blowing. Like it, it feels like a 3D Mario platformer. It's not going to change your life like Mario Galaxy did. But 
What I like, oh, and you missed you missed one component of the the perfect clear for every level. So in every level, they have three green stars to collect, a stamp to collect, and getting to the top of the flagpole. So there's that. I don't know if you mentioned that, but I mean, you mentioned that it's there. But it, it on the world map, the flag that raises above the level when you clear it, uh, only a special flag will raise if you reach the top of the flagpole when you beat the level. So you could collect everything, but let's say you don't have the power up needed to get to the top of the flagpole at the end of the level. Well, then you haven't technically gotten everything. I think that's kind of a nice twat touch. So um, I like it a lot. I like – and uh, those uh, that social sharing component actually plays into one of my favorite parts of the game. Now, you mentioned that if you collect everything on your first playthrough of a level, you have no reason to go back to it. Uh, did that happen most of the time or just some of the time or maybe like 50-50? I would say about 50% of the time. Okay. I would get I would get all three green stars in a level. And, and, and the levels can – can be three minutes long. So you may have this entire level done in three minutes. Yeah, there, if are, you've gotten every- there are some levels that can be a bit shorter. Yeah, I agree. Right. Um, so I, I've i been experiencing a, a less, like a lower percentage of collecting everything. And that's because I'm, I'm just kind of going through it because like to have – like to have fun. I'm not really trying super hard. If I miss anything, I'm specifically not going back because – my philosophy and my thinking is this gives me a reason to go back with people because if I go through and collect everything, then I'm done with the game and then there's kind of no reason to really bust it out again. But if I, if I, if I beat the game, I'm planning on just playing through and beating the game. And let's say I'm missing 60 or 70 stars. Like this is my local multiplayer game. And I am excited because I have not had one of those for years like for years people come over and it's like you know 10 years ago it, it was like people came over to my place and it's like okay let's bust out smash brothers there we go okay well that got old after like the seventh year melee was out or whatever okay so then brawl revitalized it a little bit but there's only so much you can do with with a fighting game and and all that so the last few years i've been in a drought I mean, I've busted out Dive Kick when I have company because it's so easy to learn, but that has kind of a quick burnout. You know, it's how long can you play Dive Kick? It's fun, but how long can you play it? I don't know. Uh, you know, 20 minutes, a half hour, and then you're kind of like, okay, well, all right, we've played like 40 matches. Let's move on now. Uh, this is the local multiplayer. Like, the next time people come to my place and I know they're gamers, I am getting out my Wii U and I'm getting out my Wii remotes and I'm saying, let's play Mario 3D World. Just... But you don't really know how it plays yet than multiplayer. I have played, well, so I've played Super Mario, uh, the new Super Mario Brothers Wii U um, at our friend Max's house. Uh, and he played the role of the guy that just hits platforms and adds things and all that. Uh, so he played the role of that guy that's freezing enemies and stuff like that. And while the rest of us were playing, and it was really fun. So I don't anticipate that this game's not going mean, to... How could this game not be fun? How could Nintendo possibly do such a good job with that game and then screw up Mario 3D World, which you just said is super fun? Yeah, I've just I've I've heard that the multiplayer in this game is not as well done. Really? It's just... Yeah. Well, we'll, we'll see. We'll see, but... Yeah, it's certainly worth playing. Whether I mean, it's, it's fun worth or not, trying. I'm going to make my friends play it when they come over. Yeah, that sounds a lot like you. Yeah, I know, but um, but but that's my thing, and all of those scrolling social things just adds one more layer to the replay value, and I think um. You know, you said it, it's it's really funny to me because you said it's a shame after three days I kind of got everything and I wish there was more there. And my exact thinking is is almost the exact opposite. It's I'm really glad there's all that there to have fun with. I can go through and kind of be casual about it. I don't have to – like I like a game where I can go through and not feel like I have to ace everything or feel bad because I didn't get an S ranking on a level – uh, or collect every single thing because I know I'm going to go back for it, and I think that's really cool. Like I'm into that, so that's that's how I feel about the game. I mean, I I would probably second everything you said about how fun it is to play uh, in general. Um, 
you know, the new power-ups are super cool. The unique things they do are super cool. Uh, the music is great. The music is really good. Um, and everything about it is just good. Like, it's just a good game. It's a really good, fun game. And I feel like I can bust it out with people around and uh, and have even more fun with it. So I'd, I'd be interested to see the next time you've got some buddies come over that want to play a game, if you if you whip it out and show it to them and expose yourself with your Wii U, and then you all play and see how it goes. I whip it out a lot. I know. So uh, I don't have a whole lot to add because, again, I'm in World 3. Um, I would just say I really am digging some of that unique stuff. I'm digging the challenge. Um, you know, when I finish it, if I'm missing a bunch of stars, I'll probably go back to some levels by myself and collect them. But I, I really like the idea of going through them with people um, and doing that. Right. What it really what it really speaks to in the the conversation about Nintendo that I wanted to have was that that just that commitment to fun. Like they are committed to making every part of the game fun. Yeah. And I appreciate that because that's not a commitment that all game companies have. In fact, it is a, it is a commitment that very few game companies have. Yeah, they yeah. And and it it is so cool the way that they you know, there's no Navi the fairy in this kind of walking you through everything. This is I like the way that you learn by uh you learn by demonstration kind of you learn by um what the hell is the word i'm looking for you learn by um by doing i guess i don't know what the word i'm thinking of is but you learn by just doing it like you it's experiential education it is it is it is they give you a cat suit and there's a wall there with footprints on it figure out what to do it's it's i mean it's not really hard to figure out what to do but they're not spoon feeding it to you and i really like what you said about that one puzzle where you like what I like is the puzzles aren't necessarily in figuring out what to do or how to do it, but, well, more less what to do, but more how in the execution. Like, you can see a screen, and you immediately know, this is what I have to do to get this, now how do I do it? But the thing that I like is that it could be the other way as well. It could be, I don't know how to do this, and the puzzle is figuring this out, and that variety is what makes the game so good. Yeah, that's true. Like... There could there are parts in the game where like once you figure out the gag, then the puzzle is solved. And that's fine too. That's but true. having both of those is what adds to the strength of, of the game. Um but yeah, there are some just like brutally hard, difficult execution based platforming stuff, which is like the hallmark of a Mario game. I want it there. Like it needs to be there for me to to like love the game. Because that's what I come to expect from a Mario game. But then it's also got these fun little puzzle things that we're talking about here that do have like puzzles where it, it, it's all about you figuring, just figuring out this puzzle and what they want you to do. And then you figure out, like, oh, that is so clever. That is so cool. Like, I'm, I'm glad they thought of that. And I did it, you know? Yeah, it's, um, it's good. It's Mario. I mean, it, and it's good that there is some challenging stuff because, like, the game, it, you know, it's like any Mario game. You can pretty much beat it. It's not super hard. But there are those parts where even a seasoned gamer such as yourself who loves hard games, God, you love them so hard. I love them. I, they need to be the harder the better. Yeah, exactly. Um, you know, you're able to go in there and get a little bit challenged and uh, and Bob's your uncle. There you go. And I like that, too. I like Mario. I don't have an uncle named Bob, though. Well, you do now. You don't. But Mario games are fun. Um, and I also believe that my... Hold on, where is it? My my 120 milligrams of pseudoephedrine sulfate and 5 milligrams of loratadine are starting to kick in because uh, it's getting really hard to think right now. So just bear with me if I'm barely able to process anything you're saying. Okay, well, it can't be any worse than your normal podcasting demeanor. I know. What? So that was like that's my experience with Super Mario World, um, and I'm loving the Wii U. This was also a game where I would play it like down in the basement on the TV, and it looks great. I guess beautiful in HD. Um, w- like the vivid colors are awesome. Yeah, I it love is all that. a really good looking game. Yeah, it is. Yeah, it's it, it's just a really great looking game. But then um, 
if it was like around time for bed and I was going to go wind down, I would bring it upstairs or I would bring it upstairs and Casey would be watching TV and I would sit, I would sit by her while I was playing the game. And that was great. Like that's super fun to be able to do that. Yeah. I'm really glad you're digging that remote play because you're getting a lot more use of it than I am. I've contemplated bringing it to bed a couple times, but my bed is 10 feet away from my couch and there's not really any like i mean if i'm gonna go to bed i'm gonna go to bed i might as well but yeah and i and i can only imagine like when you know when we have when we have the baby and the baby's a little older and we need to put stuff on tv like there i am with my wii u pad yeah oh absolutely absolutely and maybe the, and maybe the baby's got sharp objects in its mouth it's okay because i've got my wii u so, gamepad. so we might need to have a, a conversation about that not being okay. We can do that off the air, though. I, I don't want to bore the listener there. But, yeah, great uh, philosophy on on parenting there. Right. I think I literally just said two opposite things. And you know what? I'm just going to go ahead and blame the 120 milligrams of pseudoephedrine sulfate and 5 milligrams of loratadine that are in my system. I, what is, which, one is, which one is making me bad right now? That's you. Oh, is that that's just natural? Yeah, no, that has nothing to do with the medicine. Okay, my body's are my body's creating antibodies that just make me worse. Right. Wow, this is a uh, oh boy, slippery slope. This will be an interesting remainder of the podcast. You know, I had something to add to what you said about Mario 3D World, and it completely escapes me. And you know why I think that is? Is it from the 120 milligrams of pseudoephedrine sulfate and the 5 milligrams of loratadine? It could be. Oh, well, but hey, listen. Hello. Listen. Hey. Um. No, there was a – oh, my God. My brain – wow. What have you done to me, John? What have you done to me? I don't know anything about drugs. I literally – are you drinking right now? No. Why not? Maybe. You always drink during our podcast. That, that's I'm why sick. you're still I'm sick. S- I'm sick. Cause, like th- – one of the least appealing things to me when I'm like actually really not feeling well is drinking alcohol. Well, I I realize that, but you're also ridiculous as a human being. So I I figured maybe you were drinking anyway. Uh, no, no, not tonight. Okay, so back to Mario 3D World. When you were talking about how you want to have a discussion about Nintendo's philosophy of gaming, I thought you were going to get way deeper than that. But you kind of just you kind of just put the tip in, and that's fine. But so basically, all you wanted to say was Nintendo just makes fun games. Yeah, for the most part, but they don't. Uh, what I, what I I guess what I was trying to get at was they don't they don't bog themselves down in kind of unnecessary mechanics and things like they they make like pure pure like distilled video games where the gameplay is the only thing yeah that is there and i appreciate that i do as well and, yeah and it's it's all about the polish of the games like they just they polish and polish and polish um and they're they make really good stuff that's uh because of, because of that it's very true very true I'll, I'll go along with that uh i did download uh nes remix by the way Okay, and you start playing it? I've started playing it. I don't want to review it yet. Um, your question was, let me know if it's a cash grab or if it's not a cash grab. I, I'm i going to say no so far. It's okay. not blown me away. $15 is a little steep. I would have preferred to pay $10. Um, we will see. The verdict is still out, so I need, to, I need some more time with it before I give you like a review review. Um, but I, sure. I'm not... I'm not pissed at myself. I mean, it's not like it's not like gone home where I might as well have lit twenty dollars on fire and then smoked those twenty dollar bills and then eaten the ashes and then That's cut myself good. with a knife. It's not very good for your health. No, at none all. of those things are. So um yeah, this isn't that bad. So that's good. But uh, I have been playing NES Remix just a, a bit. I'm going to continue playing Mario 3D World. Uh, so, you know, when I review something on this podcast, it destroys my desire to continue playing the game. Did you Have I told you this? No. So, well, I just did. So if I review something on the podcast and I'm like 90% done with it, I will not necessarily finish that game because I – what I like about this podcast is – when I'm playing video games nowadays, I feel like I'm being productive, even though it's kind of a waste of time. 
because even though I'm having fun, I feel like I am it, I'm researching. I'm essentially researching for the podcast, right? I think that's fair. Yeah. So when I reviewed Batman Arkham City, I wanted to keep playing as Catwoman, doing some post-game stuff. Nope. Nope. Reviewed. Done. The end. Uh, you, know, you know, you can always revisit stuff on the podcast. But I don't feel uh, compelled to do so, really. I think what I'll probably do is maybe I'll get to a point where I've got like eight games I, I have a little bit of playing to do on and then just like kind of general recapping later or something. I don't even know. But same with Wind Waker HD. I haven't beaten that. I, I'm at Ganon. I can I could beat it in like an hour. I could go beat it right now before bed. I'm not going to because then what am I going to say next week? Oh, I killed Ganon, by the way. Go check that out. That was cool. No, that's dumb. That is dumb, and you are dumb for saying that. Okay. I think that's fair. I, I think killing Ganon is cool. Well, have you ever killed him before? Uh, Yeah, in a couple of games. I didn't think so. So exactly. So you don't know what you're talking about. But um, so I've been playing Pokemon Y. I've, I've played like oh, a lot of like 30 or 40 hours at least. And uh, I've been wonder trading, and I, I started our last podcast playing it. I'm not going to talk about it until I beat it. There's no way. There's no how f- way. How far in are you? Uh, I believe I have half of the gym badges. I mean, you're probably playing that game kind of as it was intended, where you are taking advantage of all of the social aspects rather than just mainlining it kind of as you're going through the game. Uh, I think that's, prob- that's probably what they wanted players to do. Is to... Is to take advantage of all that social stuff. Yeah, well, to a degree. Did I tell you? The, did I tell you the story about the the woman on the train that talked to me about? Yes. It? Yeah. Okay. I don't know if I said. A, did I tell that on this podcast? No, you wrote a you wrote a short little blurb about it on the uh, on the website. Okay. Okay. So um so listener, go to unqualifiedgamers.com dot com and uh, look. It was from uh, mid January, uh, early January, uh, and it is a, a story I wrote. Uh, basically, a woman uh, started a conversation with me on the train, a stranger, because she saw me playing Pokemon and told me about Wonder Trade, which is one of their social aspects. Before that point, I hadn't really delved into the social aspect. Of the of that game of Pokemon Y, but since then I've gotten more into it. Like I was saying earlier about the global trading system and things like that, so I've started to tap into it a little bit more. Um, but um, it, it's uh, and I'll talk about it when I fully review the game. But Pokemon is one of those games where there's a lot of features and a lot of subtle things that the game doesn't tell you in the game. Like you need to research them. I actually still have my Pokemon Red, Blue, and Yellow strategy guides on my bookshelf. And I've been thinking about pulling them out because in those strategy guides, there's a table which shows you what elements are strong against what elements and what are weak against other elements. Because when I was, dude, 15 years ago, I had that table memorized like it was nobody's business. I could tell you exactly what psychic was strong and weak against, exactly what leaf, grass, and ground, and like everything. I knew the whole thing. And they've since added steel and fairy and maybe one or two other ones I can't think of. Um, and I don't, I don't have those memorized. That information is kind of sprinkled in the game occasionally. You'll get somebody that's like, hey, flying is strong against ground, lol. But other than that, you're really not told a lot. Like it's a very do it and learn kind of game. And the social aspects are the same way. There's no guy that you talk to that's like, hey, check out Wonder Trade. Here's what it does. Or, hey, check out Global Trading System. Here's what it does. Like, they're just kind of there. Yeah, and that's actually one of the things I didn't like was I didn't even know about – I mean, I didn't even know about um, the, the the social stuff. In fact, I didn't even know – when I first started the game, I didn't even know about, like, that super training stuff. Uh, Mega Evolve? Mega Evolution? No, no, I knew about Mega Evolution. You know that, that like, super training mini game oh, you can do God, with the soccer that... balls? Yeah, I didn't even know. Like, I didn't even know about that at the start of the game, and I didn't know. The only reason I found it was because I like hit the right and left arrows for some reason on the bottom screen. They, they when I was playing it, but they do give you a tutorial on that mid game. Okay, it just feels like they've buried some of that that shit and they just didn't they didn't explain it, which is which is fine because people that probably know Pokemon probably know exactly what all of that stuff is. 
it's just I you know I haven't done any of that in so long. Well, it, yeah, it, or Pokemon Ami. I did not I did not <laughs> know anything about that either. Right, those things I think get addressed like eight or ten hours into the game. So they get introduced eventually. They're they're accessible right away, but you don't necessarily know about them from in game. And uh, part of the reason I want to finish the game, at least the story mode, before I review it fully, is that I think that's very very interesting and unique game design. In a lot of ways, they haven't changed. It, I mean, honestly, all of that is the exact same way the world worked in Pokemon Red, Blue, and Yellow, first generation, if you think about it. I mean, all these things, even being able to trade with a link cable and things like that, they don't really tell you that stuff. Yeah, I, I suppose that's true. It, it's very interesting to me. And, you know, you go to the shops, and the shops don't tell you, uh, you know, exactly what certain stones evolve what Pokemon. They don't. They don't tell you just from scrolling through your inventory how much of a certain item you have you have to try and purchase it first like there are there are small concessions small game design tweaks that have appeared in role playing games as they've evolved over time that kind of uh that cater to the player and and give you more information and none of that is really there in pokemon uh, well, not I mean, not none of it, but there are certainly things missing from Pokemon that could make it a little smoother and a little more um, player, kind of hold the player's hand a little bit more that they, they specifically don't do. And at first it bothered me. And it's interesting because now 30 hours in, I have it all down pat. I figured it out and I've got it. It's that experiential learning you talked about with Mario. So that's why, like, there was a point I was 12 or 15 hours in, and I was like, oh, okay, I can review this game. But then I started thinking, and I was like, holy crap, I've, like, internalized a lot of these game mechanics and the game system. Like, it's very interesting to me how Pokemon works that way. So I'll talk about that on a future podcast. But you specifically, you seemed very, because I also mentioned to you when you said to me, I want to talk about the experience of Nintendo stuff. And I was like, oh, yeah, well, I've been playing Pokemon so I can relate. And you were, you were adamant about, well, Nintendo didn't make Pokemon. Game Freak made Pokemon. Uh, yeah, well, I mean, to me, it's a, it's, I don't know, maybe, maybe it's just, maybe it is just me. But Pokemon to me doesn't feel like a standard Nintendo property. Probably not. I don't know. It just doesn't, it doesn't. It doesn't fit in that same mold to me as what I think of when I think of a Nintendo game. Yeah, that makes sense. I, maybe it's just maybe it's just me. Have you ever played any of the Fire Emblem games? I have not. Are those produced by Nintendo? I don't think so. Hmm. Okay, I'll have to look into that because I've been thinking about getting a Fire Emblem game as well. Gotta bite my teeth on that. Sink my teeth into that series. Put your mouth around it and blow. Speaking of that series. putting mouth around things, uh. How was your weekend, John, as we wrap up this exciting episode, 57 of Unqualified Gamers? Uh, the weekend was good. My uh, my parents were in town, down from Illinois. Um, it was another, I worked, but they were still in town because it was a, a baby shower for my wife. So um, they were here, and there was a baby shower that happened, and everybody had a lot of fun, and I was working the whole time. And that happened, and then I... My, I don't know if I talked about this on the podcast. I feel like I did, but my originally something happened to my computer, and my I called the company that that sold me the computer. Um, it's a company called Digital Storm. They're a small company out out in California. Wait, originally and, something happened to your computer? Yeah, it stopped working. Okay, so like like video games stopped working, and I I called the company and I got the computer last April and it's a solid computer. I mean, it was, I, you know, I paid a good amount for it in terms of computers as far as computers go and it shouldn't be breaking already. Right. <laughs> so, and cause I'm still under warranty. If anything, it should break one day after my warranty expires. But, um, I called them up and we went through this really extensive, uh, testing process where like I tested basically everything on the computer and we determined we meaning the technician and I determined that it was my motherboard. So they sent me a new motherboard. This all happened like right after Christmas. Um, they sent me a new motherboard and 
the the technician was like, yeah, you'll get the motherboard and then call us and I'll help you install it. And I was like, okay, I think I can do this. I think this is something I can do. <laughs> yeah, right? okay. So I get the mother I get the motherboard and listener, I I am not a handyman. I I cannot fix things. So I get the motherboard and it's big. It's way bigger than I thought a motherboard was. I thought a motherboard was smaller. Uh no, it's big. It's a motherboards are large. Um and there's just a lot of stuff on a motherboard. Yeah. Like there's yeah, no, there's 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 wires everywhere and stuff hooks everywhere into a motherboard. Yeah. So I get the motherboard and uh, and I call him up and I'm like, Shit. like I, I might be in a little over my head. So we spend some time uh, putting together the, the motherboard and I take the old one out. I get everything. I get everything done. It takes about an hour and a half to get everything done uh, and like screwed back in. And like originally I screwed in the heat sink wrong. So I had to unscrew that and re kind of reattach the bracket to that. Um, uh, and then I realized that I had forgot to plug in like a power cable to the motherboard. And not only did I forget to plug in the power cable, I screwed everything in on top of that cord. So I had to unscrew everything again and take it like all out to get to the cord. Good. So when all was said and done, it took me about two and a half hours, which it, uh, to anybody that is computer savvy, I'm sure they could have done this far faster than that. But listener, I want you to know this was the first time I had ever worked on, on the inside of a computer like this before. So I was actually very proud of myself that I managed to do it. Uh, yeah, I kind of am too. Yeah, but I got everything done. I actually reattached. I, I even put a little more um, heat glue, whatever that silver glue is that transfers heat. I even put a little more of that in between the heat sink and the processor because that stuff kind of wears off if you work on it. Oh. So they told me I should put on more. Um, so I even put on more of that stuff by myself, and that shit gets everywhere if you've ever worked with it. It's the silver stuff, and the silver gets everywhere. Um, but I got all that all that connected, got the like the the you know the video cards back in and everything, and I start playing playing stuff again on the computer. And about three days later, it starts to to basically break. It breaks again. Um, and I'm like, are you, are you kidding me? So, um, I lived with that for a while because it, it happened pretty intermittently, but about three days ago it happened to just, it, it was a complete breakdown. And so I ran through all the tests again and it turns out that it's actually a bad video card that I've got. Good. Yeah. So, um, and I don't fault, and here's the thing, I don't fault the company that put the computer together at all because I know that like parts can be made not they can be made bad right like you can get a bad computer part and i understand that yeah uh, and they they've gotten they have no way of knowing that i mean they they run through torture tests on all of their components um before they ship out your computer but like i understand that that they could run a torture test for a day and have nothing go wrong with the computer and then just assume that everything's fine but it, in fact it's like a it's a it's a weak component that they have so regardless i got i got a bad video card so i called up the company again this company is called digital storm um i say this because i had a great experience with them so if you're looking for a company to go with for to to get a, a gaming pc i would go with them um, and Digital Storm, the- if you're looking to sponsor a podcast, we are looking. Email us at unqualifiedpodcast at gmail dot com. So I I called up the place again, and it's a it's a small company. So I actually got to talk to the same tech guy that I talked to a few weeks ago, which was really cool. Um, and we talked again, and he's like, "Yeah, I'm I'm really sorry, but we'll have to set you know we'll send out a video card to you." And I was like, "Well, here's the thing. Um, at this point now, it's we're like eight months later." is there any way I could like upgrade my video card at this point? And he's like, Oh yeah, sure. We can figure out a way to do that. And I was like, how about I pay the difference between the retail cost of the video card now minus the retail cost of my video card when I bought it? And he's like, yeah, that's fair. Cause it's all covered under warranty. So I'm getting like a $400 video card for 90 bucks. So I kind of hate you a little bit for that. Yeah, so they're sending that out, and uh, you know, I'm it, and and not only that, he like it's I I called at at like five p.m. their time on Thursday, and the part shipped today already. Like they already got all of that stuff through the works to ship to me today. 
Which so is Monday really... for the for the we record we're recording right now on a Monday, so three sure. days. Yeah, well, two business two days, business because he could. Yeah, he couldn't have done anything on on that Thursday because I called when they closed. Um, and yeah, it was two two business days. They they're shipping. They've already shipped the part out to me. Um, so that's really cool. Super excited. I'm gonna have like a crazy new video card. I got like a. I don't know video cards at all. Um, I got like a G uh, a GeForce GT 750 or something like that, or GX 750, FX 750, something 750. Um, but yeah, that was that was just another experience I had over the weekend, and it was it was very pleasant. Um, they've been great to work with. Yeah, that's kind of awesome. Um, I believe that is the video card I needed to get if I wanted to actually run Call of Duty Ghosts on my computer, which I purchased and cannot run. Uh, so kudos to you. Thankfully, with the fact that Steam is what it is, uh, you will always own that game. I sure so will. So when everybody's playing Call of Duty Ghosts in six years and you finally have a PC that can play it, you will be able to play it with everybody else. Hey, you know what you should do? You should email Steam's customer service and see if they will refund you. Really? Oh, you didn't buy it off Steam, did you? No, I bought it through Green Man Gaming. Oh, I don't know anything about that company. Good luck. Uh, I reviewed their customer service on that one podcast. (laughs) Yeah, I think you did. I don't think it went very well, if I remember correctly. Well, they were fine. They just weren't very quick. And, I mean... If if I if I just bought a game and I was like yeah okay I I can, like most of the time it wouldn't matter but it was like that was my last weekend off for like two weeks uh, a weekend like that I was able to play a lot of games and my friend got it specifically to play with me so that that put a time constraint on it so that wasn't fair on their end to have to deal with it I get that it was like. It's not like most people are like, I need this video game to work in the next 48 hours. You know, like, so that sucks that I did that to them. But at the same time, they it took them like a week to get it resolved. So even if I hadn't had that, that was kind of a pain in the butt for the amount of time. But, I mean, whatever. Now I have it in my library, sitting there, doing nothing. And I can't upgrade and get a video card that will work because my motherboard won't support a video card up to that amount. So you're also, you would need a new motherboard as well. Yeah, so you're also uh, really lucky. And now, see, I, I'm familiar with the inside of a computer. I took apart my, my parents' old gateway computer um, when we were in high school. I was like 16 or 17, and I opened it up and installed a DVD – or no, a CD rewritable drive because that, that had just happened. You can write a CD. That's crazy. Holy crap. You can put whatever you want on there? Yeah. So we had a CD-ROM drive, and I, I added a CD rewritable drive in there, and that was a big deal. So, uh, And then in college, I, I tweaked. I think I added some a couple memory sticks to my motherboard or something, uh, like my junior or senior year. So uh, I've been in and well, out. Don't get, don't get me wrong. I've done that. Like, oh, okay. Putting in, putting in RAM is nothing. Like I've seen the inside of a computer. I've done, I've done a couple of things. Oh, yeah. I've... Like I had another computer where I reconnected the power for my for my um, CD drive that got unhooked during during transit. Okay. So like I I like know how to do stuff, but 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 putting in RAM and even like putting in a video card is much different than hooking in a motherboard. No, I know, I know. You made it sound like you had never done anything. No, no, no. I don't think I would have tried. I don't think I would have tried to put put in a new motherboard and everything into the motherboard if I had never worked in the computer ever. Okay, because because I was going to say, I was going to give you extra props because even having messed around with the insides of my computer quite a bit, like I've, I've swapped cards in and out, I've, I've done a lot of stuff, I still, when I find out that I need to upgrade my motherboard if I want a better video card, I was like, then I'm not getting a better video card. Like that was it, you know. Uh, unless, unless I honestly Google Hangouted or s- video Skyped with our our techie friend Logan in Denver, like unless I had him on, literally instructing me step by step. There's no way. There's no way I'm gonna do it. I just I don't I don't want it that badly. Uh, I don't care that much. I will survive not being able to play Call of Duty Ghosts. I don't need to drop over $500 on a new motherboard and graphics card and spend 
hours upon hours figuring out how to install it and having a zillion no it no no that game is not worth it <laughs> you know what though at some point you just buy a new gaming pc and at some point i will i will buy a new gaming pc which is fine but that time is not right now because it will run that, everything yeah I need. that that time is not now that's exactly no, right definitely not and uh speaking of the time not being now you want to hear my weekend I have been looking forward to this story, not because I know anything about wrestling, but because there was like a social media explosion about wrestling. Did you see it other than me? Yeah, there were other there were other people that I follow that were posting stuff, too. OK. And there were people that I follow like on Twitter that don't know anything about wrestling that were like retweeting wrestling stuff. Yeah. And I was like, this is this is weird. Yeah, it was a little insane. Hold on, first I'm actually I'm literally pulling up my calendar right now because I can't remember if I did anything else fun this weekend. Like, well, clearly I didn't do anything that fun this weekend. If uh, if I don't remember, no, I actually did have fun this weekend. My parents came into town for uh, what they come in town for? They came in town for something. Restaurant week, Chicago restaurant week. It's like two weeks where th- there are really, really nice restaurants like these these gourmet steakhouses and stuff, and they offer pre-fixed meals uh, for set prices. So you can get lunch at certain places for either $22 or $33 or dinner at some places for either $33 or $44. And $44 is still a lot for dinner, but uh, I went to this like Michelin star steakhouse with my parents and got like – a super gourmet like jumbo scallop for an appetizer uh, followed by this piece of salmon that was ridiculous uh, followed by this like uh some kind of chocolate bread pudding dessert that was ridiculous um so and the kind of stuff that would normally cost you like 80 or 90 dollars or more so um that's kind of exciting. So I, I actually participate in Restaurant Week quite actively, and it's every January because that's the slowest time for restaurants, obviously. Um, yeah, and you go, and it's it's really fun. So I always go to a few restaurants for that week, and that was fun. I went to Three Forks on Saturday, um, which I've never heard of and will probably never go to again, but I sure liked that salmon, and my dad let me have a bite of his filet mignon, and it was delicious. I feel like I've heard of Three Forks as a as like a very – expensive good place like I, that, that's i think it's a famous place well the guy when the guy our server was telling us about the non prefix items and he was mentioning some kind of cut of steak that was 119 dollars so yeah my dad getting a filet mignon plus an appetizer and a dessert for 44 not a bad deal <laughs> Not bad. Yeah. And and again, it's only a couple weeks. That, well, it used to be one week, but they've extended it to two weeks because it's so popular. You know, it's like I, I don't go out a ton during the year, really, unless I'm with friends. Um, so I kind of splurge a little bit in January, you know, go to a few places. Chicago is a very foodie city. So I'd be I'd be a fool to not try out some new places at least a couple weeks a year, you know. Yeah, absolutely. You know, it's it's. It's it's an interesting catch twenty two living in the city because it's like you're in the city. There's so much to do. However, it's so expensive to live in the city, and you're generally so busy in the city that you have neither the time nor the money to actually do those things that are cool. Like I used to live two blocks away from the theater that showed Blue Man Group. I've never seen Blue Man Group. Never seen him. I lived literally two blocks away from the theater where they did it every weekend. Never did it. So it just – that's just how it is in the city. Uh, you know, there's all this cool stuff, but it's like by the end of the week on Fridays, I usually go to the gym and then pass out by 10 o'clock. And then Saturday, it's just hang out with friends, you know. So it's – restaurant week is a nice excuse to like, all right, let's get the energy up to actually enjoy the city while I live here. Um, you know, because God knows how long I'll actually live in Chicago. So – Absolutely. Yeah. So that's my my thinking on it. So the Royal Rumble, the 2014 WWE Royal Rumble was on Sunday on pay-per-view. This is, by the way, John, where most of our listeners stopped listening. The Royal Rumble was always like the one event that even even when I stopped watching wrestling, which was what, like 10 years ago, I would still come and watch the Royal Rumble with you guys. (laughs) That's right. You did. Just just because the, the idea of it is fun. 
right? I mean, you get to see everybody. Yes. Like you get, you get. It's just, it's just a big cluster, f- and that's that's fun. So I always really liked the Royal Rumble. Yeah, and the Royal Rumble is. I mean, it's my favorite event of the year. So for those of you who don't know, the Royal Rumble is the name of a pay per view. The Royal Rumble match is the main event, and it, there are thirty superstars. Two superstars start in the ring, and uh, in order to eliminate your opponent, in order to be eliminated, you have to be thrown over the top rope and both of your feet touch the floor, okay? Uh, A new entrant comes in every two minutes. So there are times when the superstar will throw out everybody else in the ring and he's the only one left until the next two minutes are up, and there are times when there are 13 or 14 people in the ring. So it can be very chaotic. And often when they have several people in the ring, that's when, oh, here comes the Great Kali or the Big Show or some other half-ton wrestler. Not half, but, you know, four or 500-pound dude. He comes in and clears house, you know, throws out like 10 people in a row or whatever. Um, so there's a lot of fun moments. There's a lot of spots. There's a lot of really good storytelling and it's it's generally the, the coolest match of the year. And the winner of the Royal Rumble match gets to go on to the main event of WrestleMania and headline WrestleMania, which is the Super Bowl of wrestling, right? So that's the Royal Rumble match. So we talked about the WWE Network a couple episodes ago. Uh, WWE it might have even been the last episode. might have been last episode. So, um, listener, just uh, really top line, WWE is soon going to be offering a network where you can st- – they're live streaming a program of WWE, just professional wrestling events, 24-7. And you're allowed to watch pa- past pay-per-views from all of their promotions on demand uh, and live stream every pay-per-view during the year. And this is nine dollars. It's ten dollars a month, so it's like Netflix or Hulu Plus or Amazon Prime for just pro wrestling, and the amount of content is insane. That this is relevant because that uh, goes live in February, so everyone's going to get WWE Network. I mean, I'm going to get a subscription. I'm pretty sure, which means that WrestleMania, which is in April every year, which means that I'm going to live stream WrestleMania legally. <laughs> Through the WWE Network, from my home. I will have a WrestleMania party. I will do that. It will be great. Fantastic. This is what I'll do for all future pay-per-views. Well, guess what? It's January. That's not out yet. Only way to get a pay-per-view is to order it on pay-per-view. Guess what? I don't have a cable box. I don't have a cable subscription. I don't want one. (laughs) Uh, I don't watch TV. I watch YouTube videos on my computer, which is hooked up to my TV. So, so... I've not missed a Royal Rumble in probably 13 years. That's not an exaggeration, 13 or 14 years. So how am I going to watch this pay-per-view? Well, I could either go to my cable provider, get a cable box, get it installed, have a guy come, hook it up, order it on HD, pay $60 for the event because that's how much it costs, uh, watch it, and then go return the cable box the next week, which is a lot of time and effort and energy. Or I could go and see it at a bar. There is one bar in all of Chicago land that I know of that shows wrestling pay-per-views, and that's the Squared Circle, which uh, is run by former WWE Women's Champion Victoria. Uh, Victoria, her real name, Lisa Marie Varen. Lisa is insanely nice. She uh, worked in TNA wrestling up until about six months ago. She's got wrestling memorabilia all over the place. Um, you know, famous superstars stop by the pizzeria whenever they're in town. It's a it's a very cool wrestling spot, very wrestling culture. I went there for a pay per view once because they show pay per views, and it was just jammed. Like I was standing by the bathroom door, and that's the closest I could get to a seat. Uh, it just, I mean, the capacity is only like 150 people, maybe. Uh, so they they jam people in there, and uh, it gets very very full. So I so all this leads to yesterday. I needed a place to watch it. Royal Rumble is one of my favorite pay per views, and I wanted a good seat. I wanted to sit down. I wanted a good seat. I got there at one o'clock on Sunday to watch the Royal Rumble, which started at seven p.m. Holy sh! So. <laughs> You got there six hours early yes. because you because you thought it was gonna be that busy. Yes, yes. The guy on the phone when I called a few days ago said, "I mean, you might be okay if you get here by two, but I can't make any guarantees." 
So I show up at one. Turns out I was a little overzealous. Turns out there were six other people there. And none of them were there to see the pay-per-view. They were just there for lunch. All right, fine. Nice. I haven't had my coffee, so I ordered some coffee. They gave me whipped cream instead of creamer, which was fine with me. Uh, so I'm sitting there, drink some coffee. Uh, thought about getting some food. All right. My friend shows up around 2.30. My, my friend uh, shows up, and then she sits down, and we're, we're sitting there. People start to kind of slowly come in. Around 3 or 4, then people really came in. I mean, by 4.30, the place was at capacity. And this is over two hours before the pay-per-view starts, right? Wow. So, yeah. So, it's it's jammed. And then Lisa shows up because she comes to all these. And she she walks around. She says hi to everybody, takes pictures with people. She'll probably sign stuff if you want her to, although it's kind of tacky. Like, she's she's a really cool person. She's very cool and very good to her fans. So, uh, so I'm sitting there. A little bit after 5.30 rolls around. There is one seat left in the entire place. One seat, apparently. Last seat is what I was told, uh, what I overheard from a, a guy. It is the seat to my right. Julia's sitting to my left, okay? She's five feet tall, probably weighs like 80 pounds. She's a little girl. She's an adult. She's legal, but she's tiny. She's sitting on my left, and we're on bar stools. At a, they, they lined up a bunch of tables in a row, kind of, so you're all kind of sitting next to each other on either side of the table, and I'm looking straight at a TV. She's looking straight at a TV. Great seat. The guy that took the last seat in the place was probably 400 pounds and took up two seats of width and sat right next to me. Of course he did. Not only does he sit right next to me, turns out he's a chain smoker. Who every 10 to 15 minutes leading up to the event, literally not exaggerating, would go outside, apparently melt a cigarette and dump it over his head, like taking a shower in nicotine, and then come in like like pig pen from peanuts, just with this cloud of of atrocious stench surrounding him. So, I'm, so he smelled good. He smelled great. So I'm sitting there, now suddenly wedged between him, and thank God I was there with a little girl, who is a, an adult, by the way, uh, instead of a dude, because I had I had to, I basically put part of my left ass cheek on her chair, because I was being violated by fat, frankly, and, uh, and horrible smell. She can smell it too, by the way. I actually showered when I got home, because my eyes were burning from the cigarette smell. Uh, so that was great. That was great. I was really happy about that. Anyway, pay-per-view starts. It's very loud in there. It's very boisterous, rambunctious. It's fantastic. Uh, Daniel Bryan is the hottest thing in WWE right now. Very, very popular. He has the opening match. It's awesome. Great match. Everybody's stoked. Okay? Cool. couple of other matches. They go, okay, great. Royal Rumble, main event. Cool. Let's do this. All right. Cool. Bunch of people enter. All right. This is really fun. It's a really good time. Daniel Bryan's the most popular guy in WWE. Surely, even though he had the first match of the night, surely he'll be in the Rumble because he's the most popular guy in the last, like, 10 years in WWE. Surely he'll be entry number 29 or 30, and he'll come in and he'll win it, and he'll go to headline WrestleMania because he's he is as popular as Stone Cold Steve Austin was back in the day. Now, they've, they've done that before, right, where they have somebody wrestle early on and wrestle in Royal Rumble, and then they also have... That person enter the Rumble? Yes, that actually happened uh, at the Rumble this year. Uh, Cody Rhodes and Gold Dust defended their tag team championships in the WrestleMania pre-show. At six, or the- Gold Dust is still around? <laughs> I won't get into that, but yes, yes. Um, they defended their tag team championships uh, in the pre-show at 6.30 and then entered the Rumble a little after 9. So yes, that happened actually specifically at that of, at this year's event, okay? Okay. So it, it's that's been known to happen. A lot of times it's happened. They'll wrestle. They'll be in the match. Entry number 30 comes in. The music hits, and it's Rey Mysterio. Who is this Mexican wrestler? He's fine, whatever. You could hear... So you could, you could hear the TV's okay. The sound isn't great at the squared circle when you've got a bar full of 200 people screaming, basically. And uh, you could hear the crowd on the TV booing, like, mercilessly. And I later read that people literally started leaving the arena when they realized Daniel Bryan wasn't in the Rumble because they were that pissed. Um, so 
it gets down to three guys, then it's down to two guys. It's Batista, Batista, who has not been under contract with WWE for four years. He, he went off to go make some movies and try MMA and didn't really give a shit about wrestling. So he just left and did his own thing. Suddenly he comes back. Batista wins the Rumble. And uh, people were not happy. People were very not happy. Uh, the, I mean, if you search for hashtag Royal Rumble on Twitter after the event, it was just acidic vitriol. Just- so they weren't they weren't happy because it was just some – some guy that had been in wrestling before but was out it for a while? They were unhappy because Daniel Bryan is – has like I said, he is as popular as The Rock was 15 years ago or Austin. I mean he is like – it's unreal the way crowds respond to this guy. It is unreal. Um, okay. It, it's insane. He's so popular and he hasn't been main eventing pay-per-views. He hasn't been main eventing Raw, really. He's just kind of there. And everyone knows he's the guy. Like, the fans want him to be the guy. Make him the guy. And instead, we got a championship match with John Cena and Randy Orton, which literally happened 11 years ago. They've been fighting for 11 years. They've been rematching. So, not interesting for people to watch. Kind of like the listener right now is like, I want this podcast to end so Cody can never talk about wrestling again. Kind of like that. Um, so the yeah, the general kind of like consensus on the internet is basically Triple H and Stephanie who are in charge don't care about the fans. All they care about are big muscular dudes who look good and they're just going to put them in main events of stuff and not actually recognize any of the talent that matters. But um. But Twitter freaked out. WWE put a poll on their Facebook page. How would you like the Royal Rumble this year? And it was loved it or hated it. Last time I checked, 7,000 people loved it and 26,000 people hated it. Holy crap. And in the 24 hours following the Rumble, you know how um, Facebook's comment system is set up so where you can, if you like the most liked comment appears top on something. It's not always chronological on a fan page. The top most liked comment on literally every post they've uh, made since the Rumble was Roman Reigns should have won. Roman Reigns was the second to last guy in with Batista. So everyone hates Batista. And then the second most liked comment on everything is something related to Daniel Bryan about how like he should have been in it. So And Mick Foley, you know Mick Foley, right? Yes, Mick, the guy, sock guy. Yes, Mick Foley. Mick Foley tweeted, I legitimately wonder if WWE hates th- their audience and wrote like a three-paragraph long Facebook post about his, how he's never been so disappointed with the WWE as to not have Brian in the Rumble. He was like, I cannot believe they've done this, and I know this will ruffle some feathers because I'm still technically under contract with them for another month doing commentary for something. And he's like, I don't even care. Like, this is atrocious. Um, it was bad. Have they responded at all? So here's the really interesting thing, and this is this is why I kind of hate wrestling, but this is why I kind of love wrestling. And a lot of you listener, listener, you're probably thinking right now, like, This is a reasonably educated guy I'm listening to. Why does he care about professionally wrestling, which is fake, by the way. I am aware it's fake. I'm aware of this. This is what's interesting to me, John. This is what's weird. You know, back in the day, they had good guys and bad guys, and you knew who was who? Of course. So, WWE is shattering the fourth wall with its storytelling And I have no idea what they're doing on purpose anymore or what they're not doing on purpose. Because Raw, the night after Royal Rumble, kicks off. Triple H and Stephanie come to the ring. And they're just like, oh, we're so happy you're all here. We had a great Royal Rumble match last night. It was fantastic. And the crowd's booing emphatically because they're bad guys. And the Rumble sucked. And they're chanting Daniel Bryan's name and all this stuff. So it's about what you expect. And they're just acting oblivious. Well, then Daniel Bryan comes out, interrupts them, and basically reads the internet to them. He's pretty much like, you know, a lot of people were chanting my name during the match last night. 
And I told you guys a bunch of times I wanted to be in the match, and I wasn't in it. So I'm demanding a title shot, and I think you guys should give me what they want. People don't want to see Randy Orton. And the crowd exploded when he said that. And he's like, people don't want to see Triple H. And the crowd freaked out when he said that. So he was literally saying what people on the internet were saying. Like, he was explaining how the internet feels. And then Triple H and Stephanie, who are supposedly bad guys, start like giving weird excuses they're like well we didn't want to actually put you in two matches because you got a concussion two weeks ago which is true that happened he got a concussion two weeks ago and from like normal management that would make sense that they wouldn't put him in two matches so they're logically playing sympathetic villains with clear like kind of clear goals But they're not really clear because they keep pissing off the audience. And then they're clearly aware of it at the same time because Daniel Bryan is literally telling them what everyone on the internet said. It's it's a mind f***. It is a mind f***. I don't know what is real and what's fake anymore when it comes to the storyline. Yeah, I still don't care. Well, that, that took way longer than it should have. No, but it's a good, it's a good story. Uh... It's, I'm lying. It's it was not. Even it's not a good that story. good a story. It it was a story. Well, it was a story that was it was a story that was told. Listener, if you made it this long, they didn't. Um, but but you, that one guy that did, thank you, guy or girl, um, that made it. Uh, hopefully, we entertained you um, for the first hour and can, a half or so. You can find us at uh, unqualifiedgamers.com. That's our home site. You can also find us on gunageek.com. That's got links to uh, our past few podcasts, as well as a host of other really good podcasts as well. Um, you can find me on Twitter. I'm at Eat Play Game. Cody is at Producer Cody. Or where, where else are we? Google Plus. Yeah. I suppose we're there Google a lot. Google Plus is pretty big. Uh, so we're on Google Plus. Just search for Unqualified Gamers. Um, or you can, it's plus.google slash Plus sign unqualified gamers. Plus is that right? Google plus dot Google dot com slash plus sign unqualified gamers. You won't remember. Just go to Google Plus and search unqualified gamers. You'll find us. Yeah, um, but yeah, you can kind of hear us every week on this podcast. If this is your first episode, thank you for joining us. Hopefully, Cody didn't ruin it for everybody. I promise I will not talk about wrestling again until WrestleMania, or until something really cool happens, like Daniel Bryan gets a title shot and then gets abducted by aliens. No, the only reason I told that story is because that's what I did this weekend. I spent nine hours at a bar to watch a wrestling pay-per-view. Because that's my life, John. That's my life. That's what I do with my life. You even sound like it's pathetic. Yeah. Well, sometimes I wonder. But I, I, I do hope that... Although I know the listener had no respect for me in the first place, I do hope that through my storytelling, the listener at least now realizes there is a deeper, like, there is a deeper level to wrestling that the vast majority of people are are completely unaware of. Um, And at, at its core, if you take the time and effort to really invest in it, it is, there is very interesting and sometimes very, good and compelling storytelling, which is why I like it. Still don't care. And with that, you're fired. Get me Paul Rudd. You don't know who that is. Yeah, I know. <laughs>